Hello, I'm Vale Sloan, Atlas Network's Strategic Partnerships Advisor. Welcome to Think Tank Shark Tank. We are thrilled to have you join us here today for something that's become a celebrated tradition on the main stage at our Liberty Forum in New York City. And we're excited to be hosting our first virtual Shark Tank competition this year. Today's competition is brought to you by the Smith Family Foundation. What does it take to win in the think tank world? Well, sound principles and research, of course, but also a talent for conveying these ideas in a way that grabs people's attention, a plan for success and a well-honed pitch. We took a page from the business community and modeled our competition on the wildly successful US television show, ABC's Shark Tank. But instead of business entrepreneurs competing, we have think tank entrepreneurs. Each of our three contestants has graduated from the Atlas Leadership Academy, our suite of think tank management training programs. In the hopes of winning our grand prize, each contestant will compete before a panel of philanthropists, our sharks. Now I'd like to introduce each of our esteemed judges. Our first judge, we have our seasoned participant in the Shark Tank, Fred Young. He is the retired CEO and former owner of Young Radiator Company, a tier one automotive component supplier. He has served on a number of boards in the private and public sectors, and he has private sector work experience at Daimler-Benz in Germany and Cummins Edge & Co in the United States. Our second judge is Heather Ray Johnson. She is the president of HRJ Consulting Limited, a grants management consulting firm located in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Heather holds a JD from Dalhousie University and a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Calgary. And finally, for our third judge, we have Montgomery Brown from the Sarah Scaife Foundation in the United States. Montgomery is the vice president of the foundation. In his past experience, he's also worked with the American Enterprise Institute and the Earhart Foundation. Now, let's review how the Shark Tank will work. First, each contestant will have five minutes to present their project, explaining its details and their plan to undertake it. Once the video presentation is over, contestants will respond to questions posed by our judges on the specifics of the project. The judging criteria focuses on three key aspects of their pitch. First, a sound plan. Secondly, does it demonstrate impact by solving a pressing problem? And thirdly, can it be executed effectively with the given budget outlined? After the presentations and Q&A, the judges will convene and award a $25,000 prize to one organization. All right, let's get started, shall we? Our first contestant is Linda Kavuka from Students for Liberty in Kenya. Linda is the director of African programs at the organization. Linda, take it away. Thank you. Uhamaji Huru is a phrase in Kiswahili language, which means free migration and the name of the campaign I'm pitching today. It is dedicated to creating awareness of the challenges faced by those seeking legal migration and settlement around Africa. Currently, we lack accessible migration channels and those who try to leave the continent face untold suffering, such as slavery in Libya, brutal working conditions in the Gulf countries, and drowning in the Mediterranean due to travel in congested lifeboats. Medicine Sans Frontiers, a humanitarian organization, reports that during the first nine months of 2020, 430 people died or disappeared trying to cross the Mediterranean. The sad reality is restrictive laws and high taxes lock out millions from local opportunities thus easier to migrate out of Africa. That is why I bring to you the Uhamaji Huru campaign that seeks to create awareness of the plight of migrants, forge free market solutions, draft a policy paper, and engage with stakeholders for the adoption of accessible migration policies. 
Our campaign shall bring forth this forgotten conversation and lay down the necessary groundwork for policy reform. Our campaign shall commence in five countries where scores migrate to, and the nationalities of the victims of the highlighted atrocities, namely Kenya, Nigeria, Burundi, Zambia, and Gambia. We shall begin by conducting extensive research, which shall form the basis of our campaign through written searches, online, and in-person campaigns. We shall host seminars in the campaign hubs and engage with stakeholders, including migration organizations, the media, our partners, and the government to debate free market solutions. Together with select consultants and lawyers, we shall draft a free migration policy paper and initiate engagements with decision makers and international organizations, share our work and contribute to policy reform towards free migration policies. We plan to complete this campaign within seven months. Our total budget is $40,000 to be financed partly by this grant and the balance by Students for Liberty and identified partners. Our intended impact with this campaign is to develop original research on free migration in Africa, reach 10,000 people with our message. And while we understand policy reform takes time, we pledge to take our message to a larger scale. Lastly, Students for Liberty shall replicate this campaign and build a greater awareness by supporting its leaders to host activities in their communities. Here is why we are qualified for this campaign. We have a vast network spanning 36 countries with 621 trained leaders. Our alumni have over 19 think tanks, NGOs, and media organizations available to offer us support. We have successfully managed two donor projects, including the Issue-Based Political Dialogue Project in Kenya in 2016 and 2017, and the Principles of Free Market Colloquium in the Boko Haram region, Northern region of Nigeria in 2018. We have also identified partners that we shall work closely with on this campaign. Africans must change the narrative and contribute to improving living conditions, value the lives of its people, and create new opportunities for prosperity. With the Uhamaji Huru campaign, we shall increase the number of supporters of free market ideas and contribute to reform of African domestic laws in favor of free migration. We envision a borderless Africa for a prosperous people with accessible migration channels to Africans from all walks of life. With your support, we shall contribute to saving the lives of our people, restore newfound hope, and help alleviate poverty in Africa. Thank you very much, Linda. Let's get another five minutes on the clock for our judges to ask questions. Fred, let's start with you. Thank you, Linda. Uh, my question relates to political support. Is there political support among any major political parties, especially in those five countries that you've targeted, for changing restrictive laws and high taxes for economic migration? And if so, how would you engage them? Students for Liberty does not necessarily work very directly with political organizations. However, we are ready to create those um, engagements with political parties in those countries where necessary. We would focus more on reaching out to individual decision makers from government and who are in charge of these um, policies, migration, settlement, and also international organizations, more on the decision makers than the political parties. Heather, you. do you have a question for Linda? Yes, Linda. Um, just curious, in the five countries that you're targeting, do you have a concept of how many people would be impacted if you're successful in changing the laws and what that would mean for them? As I had mentioned in my pitch, while we have set the campaign to begin in five countries, our message is actually more general than limited to these five countries. So we have set our target of reaching out to 10,000 people and beginning first to change mindsets because that's where we are beginning. People have a very negative attitude towards people from neighboring countries. And when you begin by changing a person's mind, you warm them up to 
to be able to support policies. So I'll put it at a minimum of 10,000 people that will begin with impacting. First, if we change mindsets, then we will, be, we, have, we will have made strides towards moving in the right direction of changing policy. Without winning the support of the people on the ground, it would be difficult for us to win over decision makers who would then not see the point of you know, pushing forward for the decisions to make this change. Again, um, the African Union at the moment is focusing on the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement to create a common market for Africa. And the second plan is to create free movement. While they want to, in, to implement that as a second step, this is a very important thing that also needs equal attention. And we feel that our campaign will be among those who stand fast to bring this conversation forward and to get the importance it requires from the region generally and from individual African countries. Okay. Monty, do you have a question for Linda? Yes, thank you, Vail. And thank you, Linda, for participating in this and for your presentation. My question is about the countries that you chose. Can you explain why your organization picked those five countries? And can you also help us understand better the past context for this? Have any of these countries taken steps in this direction before? Are there other countries that have tried agreements that are somewhat similar to what you're proposing? Some of these countries feature the people who you will find migrating out of Africa. Nigeria is top of the list. Everywhere you go in the world, if you see an African, there's high chance that they're Nigerian. Kenya also marks a second country where we have a lot of people migrating to the Gulf countries that is closer to us in the Eastern Africa. And in Burundi, because of their political instability, a lot of Burundian people had to move out of the country to the neighboring countries. And Gambia also. It may not, much is not known about them because it's a small country, but so many young people due to the long dictatorship they had, try to leave the mid country through the ocean. So these countries represent most of, most of where most of the people who are victims of the atrocities I mentioned are coming from. Therefore, they would really resonate with this campaign. They have their brothers, their sisters, their uncles who have attempted to leave. Maybe they've never heard from them. And for me coming from Kenya, I know Hundreds of women are captives in um, the Gulf countries. So another thing is also, these countries also have a lot of migrants from their neighboring countries that the residents are negative towards and don't allow them to come into their country. Again, my country, Kenya, hosts the largest refugee camp we have in the world, yet we do not have laws that allow these refugees to settle in the country. What you see, for example, in Europe, having refugees come in, and then there's a process to let them in the country. So these countries also do not have a way of handling the refugees that are in the country or migrants from um, neighboring countries. Perfect timing Thanks. there, Linda, as we come to the end of our five minutes of question time, which leads us to our next contestant, Greg Brooks from the Better Cities Project in the United States. Greg is the president of the Better Cities Project, and he's also previously worked as a journalist and as a public affairs professional. Greg, the floor is yours. Thanks, Vail. Today, I'd like to talk about poverty and justice about a century old policy that's held millions of Americans back and about trillions of dollars in economic pain inflicted on generations of people. I'm here to pitch the 1921 project from Better Cities Project and to explain how it will help almost 100 million Americans by rolling back restrictive zoning in cities across the country. We call it the 1921 project because that's the year Washington started encouraging local zoning uh, in towns and cities across the country, a move that was almost immediately used to segregate and harm poor and minority audiences. The impact is not just something from the history books either. The legacy of it and the economic damage of it continues today. It's a story a hundred years in the making, but we don't think it'll take that long to fix. What it will take is a new approach, which we have. It'll take an organization built to work with cities across the country, which is what Better Cities Project is all about. And it'll take a reframing appropriate for this cultural and political moment, harnessing social justice to advance economic liberty. Why zoning reform? Because economic rights are civil rights, and a hundred years of bad zoning policy has helped cut millions of Americans off from the American dream. 
Zoning hurts poor households like the one I grew up in. We couldn't subdivide our lot or build a granny flat when that money would have helped. It stymies the immigrant and the entrepreneur who may want to repurpose a building downtown as an economic toehold to a better life. And it's an equal opportunity bad policy that harms well-intentioned developers, community nonprofits, young families looking for their first home, and virtually every other group you can imagine with arbitrary decades old rules about who can build what and where. And along the way, who gets to move forward and who doesn't. The 1921 project wants to make restrictive zoning morally untenable and politically dangerous. It would be great if elected officials believed what we believe, but I don't need them to believe to achieve success. I just need them scared enough to act. So how do we do this? Well, we plant seeds. Some of them are gonna sprout quickly and some are gonna take a long time to grow. But we do have some ideas about what success looks like in the first year. We imagine a coalition of 2,500 or more individuals and organizations across the country involved with this project. Eight to 10 virtual town halls with those coalitions to activate the grassroots and grass tops that we need. Six to 10 modular policies that allow cities to incrementally or wholesale change their zoning policies as appropriate for their situation. And five or more live events where BCP and its local partners can passionately make the case on the ground for rolling back zoning's history of economic harm. It's a game of base hits. We're gonna provide the policy and the publicity, the local groups are gonna apply political pressure and together we are going to make sure that those base hits add up to something monumental. Our $151,000 budget for the project is partially funded. We're ready right now to start on the core research and policy development and a year long campaign of op-eds. But what your funding tonight would provide is reach, to get into local market PR uh, partnerships because you advance local government issues best, not when a guy from out of town in a suit, a guy like me shows up, but rather when you have passionate local people making the case and leverage because that's what you get with the right policy and the right people aligned to the cultural moment. You're not funding our startup tonight. You're funding a rollout to 300 cities affecting 95 million people. And if we are successful, that policy will impact things like housing reform, economic reform, rolling back government corruption. It's a truly expansive and important effort. So many people today are talking about change. And, and that means something different to almost everybody. But I think anything that's, that has a hundred year history of racism and economic decline deserves our attention and focus. And I hope Frank, you'll agree. we are unfortunately out of time on the five minutes there, but we will now turn to the five minutes on the clock for Q and A from our distinguished judges. Let's start with Heather this time. Heather, do you have a question for Greg? Yeah, Greg, you started your presentation talking about poverty and inequality and, and uh, the impact that these zoning laws have had over the last hundred years on people. And I wonder if you could give us a better uh, an idea of what that, if you're successful in any particular city or the group of cities, what the, what the economic impact or the upside is for the people on the street of your project. Thanks, Heather. The to me, the, the best thing that this project accomplishes is get, getting government a little bit more out of the way so that people are free to flourish. That's gonna look very different from community to community. In a highly urbanized and dense area, it may take the form of people being able to more easily start a business downtown because the zoning is relaxed. In a sprawling, more horizontal market like Southern California, you've got a lot of post-war housing in poor neighborhoods that has accrued a great deal of value and that value cannot easily be in, unlocked with the restrictive zoning in place. And so it, to me, anything that will allow somebody who 
may have generationally come into home ownership. You know, they have a, a house that their parents or their grandparents gave to them or somebody who has a bit of money and an idea, but is restricted from improving their community by zoning. Those are the sorts of benefits I see that, uh, in terms of unlocking sort of an economic dynamism that's lacking right now. It's held back. Monty, you. do you have a question for Greg? Sure, thanks, Val. And thank you, Greg. Uh, Greg, it, it would be helpful to get a little bit clearer understanding of how deep or how radical the project is intended to be. I had the impression during most of your presentation that if you were against zoning uh, fairly broadly or fundamentally, any response to the first question you spoke about, perhaps places where zoning would be relaxed, which implies something different than eliminated. So can you help us understand better the degree to which you're, uh, uh, you and your colleagues are opposed to zoning and also whether this involves zoning beyond residential restrictions? It potentially can involve zoning uh, changes beyond residential, although residential is the low hanging fruit. And so that's where we'd put our early emphasis. I, I have a fairly radical vision of wanting maximal zoning rollback, but the reality is in most cities, zoning is a very powerful political uh, piece on the chessboard. And so it's unreasonable to expect that we can go from full rigid zoning to, to nothing. Efforts like the recent zoning rollbacks in Minneapolis and Portland took decades to achieve. So what, although the vision is radical, I think the actual wins from city to city are going to be relaxations, incremental changes, Frankly, the the big victory to me is the reframing of how people think about zoning. The first time I hear people talking about the privilege of zoning, then I will know that our messaging is starting to take hold. And I, I frankly don't believe that over the long haul, you can maintain rigid zoning once you link it to its bona fide history of racist intent. Fred, do you have a quick question for Greg? A, a quick question. Um, who are going to be your natural opponents? And will this become a national political issue, do you think? And who will be your allies nationally? So our natural opponents are folks in the suburbs who own single family homes. And they often vote Republican, but they believe that part of their compact with the government is that the government will maintain and increase their property values at all costs. Uh, the, the other uh, natural uh, opponent are in the larger cities in the BCP portfolio. As I said, zoning is a powerful political tool. I, I don't want to give anybody the idea that we think rolling back zoning in Chicago, for example, is achievable in a single digit year time span. However, what we do know from our research is that cities are herd animals. And if we can get second and third tier cities doing this, it will eventually spread. I think our- Thank you for that, Greg. My apologies, but we have to crack on to our final contestant now, which is Roxana Nicula from the Fundacion para el Avance de Libertad, AKA Fundalib from Spain. Roxana is one of the co-founders of Fundalib and she is chair of the board of trustees. Roxana, please begin your presentation. Hi everyone, although I can't be in the same room with you, I know that I'm talking to many people today who have started one or more businesses in their lives. You know how difficult it is even under normal circumstances, including how costly taxes can be. In Spain, the barriers are especially burdensome. We have the highest self-employment tax in the European Union, making it extremely difficult for young people to become entrepreneurs. We need your help to combat this business killing tax, which is why I'm pitching the Young and Self-Employed campaign. The Young and Self-Employed campaign aims to get rid of this self-employment tax, the infamous quota de autonomos, thus removing barriers to become entrepreneurs for the currently unemployed young people or employed in public administration or corporations. 
Our burning reality is this. Over 40% of young people in Spain are unemployed. Yes, the COVID pandemic has added to this, but even before, Spain still had one of the highest unemployment rates in Europe. The self-employment tax adds more gasoline to the fire. Here is a key fact. Self-employed people in Spain are forced to pay 4,000 euros per year just to operate, no matter whether they make an income much less profit or not after the first year in business. To give you an idea, in the nearby Portugal, you don't have to pay self-employment tax. In Germany, neither, if your monthly income is less than 1,700 euros. We talked to some young people on the streets, and here is what they have to say. ¿Crees que es complicado emprender en España para una persona joven? Yo creo que es bastante complicado en España como país si lo comparas sobre todo a Estados Unidos. Que hay un montón de regulaciones y es muy difícil crear empresas. Eh, yo hice un intento hace unos meses. En te tema de impuestos y también a la hora de legislati eh, legislativo, yo creo que es bastante complicado aquí en España. Las facilidades que se dan aquí no son las adecuadas como para emprender, es decir, no... De hecho, te ponen más pegas que, que te ayudan. La administración pública pues, no es muy, muy ágil y eso pues, al final perjudica a todo lo demás. Luego tenemos también la tasa de autónomos, que eso es que te quitan dinero, tengas ingresos o no, o sea que es que te dan por todos lados. La verdad que la burocracia que tenemos en, en España también dificulta bastante todo lo de abrir un nuevo negocio, aparte de todos los impuestos que tienen que pagar y todo eso. Los impuestos sobre todo, que los autónomos pues tienen que... Uf, tienen que pagar un montón. La verdad que se te quita la gana de emprender en España. Para mí son héroes la, las personas que hacen empresas eh, aquí en España. So here is how our young and self-employed campaign will work. Our white paper analyzing the current youth startup business environment will provide us with strong arguments against this tax. It will guide policymakers, mass media and grassroots. We want to make it simple but attractive for them to digest our message. We will contact relevant stakeholders, tax and labor representatives, opinion leaders, whom we will be asking for coverage by using the arguments from our campaign. We are thinking of Gloria Alvarez and others, YouTube Libertad TV channels and V bloggers to pitch in and help us deliver the message. We are confident that our advocacy in social media with funny memes, video content presentations, and virtual debates will not leave people indifferent. We want to get rid of this tax for young people under 30, or at least if they generate income under a minimum, they shouldn't be forced to pay for trying to stay in business or suffer double taxation when they combine business and job. By doing that, we will be contributing to transforming young unemployed into young entrepreneurs. Remember, over 40% jobless. We plan to do it in around 18 to 20 months top. Our success in this past five years of uh, existence helped conveying libertarian ideas and political reforms to policymakers and grassroots. Through our studies, uh, campaigns, lobby, uh, we've contributed to lower taxes on wealth, inheritance, and in the near future for the income of millions of, ta of Spanish pa taxpayers. So with your help, we can be successful on this one too. Our budget is uh, 37,000 US dollars. We already have 12,000 committed uh, from our own funds. So let's get uh, young people back to work to become business owners because more businesses mean more jobs, prosperity, and a better future for our youth in Spain instead of lining up at the unemployment agency or at the immigration office of another country. Thank you for your commitment to our young and self-employed campaign. Thank you, Roxana. Right on five minutes. And let's get our next five minutes set up for questions from our judges. Monty, let's hear from you first. Thanks, Vale. And thank you, Roxana. Spain is known for having very strong regional differences. And I'm wondering how that may uh, relate to your project. Are there significant differences in the unemployment rates across the different regions? Is your emphasis mostly going to be national or is there a regional aspect to it as well? Uh, no, in, in the case of the self-employment tax, it's a national tax that everyone has to pay and it's the same uh, in, in our case for every region. However, of course, we can push 
uh, with regional stakeholders and labor stakeholders in order to try and work towards our way to the national government to do this. But it's a national task, so it affects the same uh, in every region. Fred, do you have a question for Roxana? Uh, yes, my question relates to the uh, realism of the expectation that young people can start a business. It's a very difficult thing to do. Are there support organizations available and sources of funding for young entrepreneurs if you're able to over overcome this taxation uh, uh, limitation? Yes, uh, uh, fortunately, uh, we have uh, many, for instance, bus business angels. And uh, while talking to young people, because our organization works a lot with, with um, not only Students for Liberty, but also other uh, kind of uh, associations of young entrepreneurs, uh, there are a lot of uh, options for them to have funding. But the main problem still remains that after the first year, uh, they need to cope with this self-employment tax, uh, and which is quite high. And for instance, there's another uh, pressing matter in, in the self-employment tax, which is uh, there are many young people who are willing to uh, mix, uh, start a small business, for instance, uh, while working a part-time in a major firm in order to, to try and cope with, with better expenses. And uh, the problem is that now they, are, uh, they suffer double taxation. They have to pay Social Security uh, when they work for the corporation. And at the same time, if they want to have a small uh, company earning a little bit uh, over the month, they also have to pay the self-employment tax. So it's, uh, it's quite unjust. And um, I believe they, they have a better chance uh, because we compare it with the rest of the countries in the European Union and they don't have such a high tax. Even in Germany, for instance, I was talking in my presentation that uh, people who earn under uh, 1,700 euros don't have to pay any self-employment tax and above that sum they have to pay around 140 euros. In Spain you have to pay three, more than 300 euros per month. I mean, it's very, very abusive. Heather, do you have a question to pose? <laughs> Yeah, I'm just curious, you know, it, it seems it's a, there's a cultural element behind this as far as uh, entrepreneurship as an option. And so if you are successful in getting rid of the tax, what sort of uptake do you expect to take have from the, the young people that you're targeting as far as moving in this direction? And how easy will it be to change that culture of um corporate state employment, per se, as the only option? Yeah, I mean, um, the reality is, yes, they learn in schools that uh, it's better to be a civil, civil servant instead of, of risking uh, what you have and then start a business. But at the same time, we have a lot of young people eager to, to start a business, and they find themselves with those uh, big barriers in among them, uh, this self-employment tax. So um, we, we want, for instance, to work with um, several associations of uh, entrepreneurs, of young entrepreneurs and uh, self-employment uh, workers that are also pushing in our direction. And um, here we, we find that we have, you know, a common ground uh, to work towards uh, admin, at least um, change this, this self-employment tax for, for those people under 30. Uh, so I, I believe we, we can be very, very successful in this scenario with the current situation we are living in Spain. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Well, any follow-up question there, Heather? No, that's fine. Thank you. Perfect. Well, Roxana, thank you very much for your time. And indeed, thank you, Greg, Linda and Roxana for your amazing pitches as our Shark Tank contestants. And also, let's not forget to thank our fantastic judges. Thank you, Heather, Fred and Monty. Thank you, our viewers at home, for joining us for this presentation and this competition. We will now excuse the judges to begin their deliberations on their pick for the $25,000 prize winning project. Now, Unlike our in-person Shark Tank competition, the winner of this virtual Shark Tank competition will not be announced right away. If you want to know who wins the $25,000 prize, you'll need to join us for our Freedom Dinner to find out who wins the competition this year. And also, 
If you watching this would like to take your spot at the Shark Tank competition at next year's in-person New York Liberty Forum, be sure to enroll and become a graduate in Atlas Network's training programs. We hope to see you up on stage next year. Well, that wraps up the program for today. Thank you again to the Smith Family Foundation for sponsoring today's competition and to all of you for joining us today. 